to, uh, and I'm Gil Sylvia, uh, director of the Coastal Oregon Experiment Station. And it's an honor to introduce our speaker today, Brad Pettinger. He's been a member of my board, I don't know, for a long time, okay. 16 years maybe. Uh, and he's going to introduce himself, so I'm not quite sure what I want to say here as part of the introduction, because um, I may repeat some of the stuff. But his story isn't unusual when you look at his history. You'll talk a little bit about your history. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see a pattern here that almost all the West Coast, particularly groundfish guys, follow in terms of those guys have been around a while, how they got into the fishery and their history and sort of starting with small fishery. So keep that in mind in terms of how fishermen transitions from one fishery to another as they grow and develop. Uh, one thing about Brad, he's highly uh, popular. <laughs> He's a really nice guy. He's highly popular. No pressure there. Well, and he's, he's really good to work with. So I think we've all appreciated that. And his dedication to improving the West Coast uh, fisheries. So one of the things, he's done a lot of stuff. Uh, he was head of the Trawl Commission for 15 years. He's now retired from that, but then jumped into the foray to become a policymaker on the Pacific Fishery Management Council. He's now designing policies for West Coast fisheries. He's, probably, he's really well known for a couple of things. He was very, very involved with the development of the ITQ groundfish fishery. Uh, uh, but he's also really well known for developing MSC fisheries. So Green Stewardship Council was the largest global certifier of fisheries in the world. Um, and he took on a challenge in a couple of levels that only anyone thought possible. First, they got the shrimp fishery, first fish, shrimp fishery in the world, certified as MSC. And that, that's all Brad didn't do it alone. There was a whole bunch of people, <laughs> including the industry itself, who worked hard to reduce bycatch in that fishery. And given how well managed it was, in fact, the joke at the, the, joke at the time was the crab industry had also sought MSC certification before the shrimp fishery. And everyone thought that the crab fishery would get certified like that. You know, it was well managed, we never seen a crash, it seemed to be, but it took five years for the crab fishery to get certified. The shrimp fishery, which is again very unusual to see a shrimp fishery certified, got certified what, a year and a half, two years? Which is very fast by MSC stamp, relatively fast. And of course, he then got worked on the West Coast groundfish fishery to get it certified, which I think most people a few years before that would say impossible. You can never get that fishery certified. It's just too many problems, uh, too many fish fisheries have, stocks have to be rebuilt, and yet they got it certified. Uh, and uh, Oregon, for its you know as a relatively small state, has probably more fisheries certified given our. Per for capita numbers here in our small coastline than maybe any state in the United States. And that's a tribute to the whole industry here who's worked so hard to get these fisheries mm -hmm. recognized as sustainable, plus the work of ODFW and the Pacific Fishery Management Council. So for all this work he's done, it's not just me saying going things about him, but he's received a lot of awards, and I'll just note one award that he got, uh, and this is just recently, he, at the White House, he was honored as being a champion of change for sustainable seafood. So he got a national recognition for all the work, work he had done on all these issues. So it's a real honor to introduce you. And anyone who can, who can uh, have how you learn to love stock synthesis, <laughs> right? So I uh, appreciate that. So thank you. Before you, get you bet. All right. Is this working? You got me? All right. Well, thank, thank you for coming. Um, I gave this talk at the um, Mont Lake Lab at, uh, in Seattle in February. I think that was the first industry person, I believe, to give a talk. So it was kind of an honor there. And so it was uh, kind of nice to see people in that audience who I'd worked with uh, through the through my time as a, a director of the Oregon Trawl Commission. And so it's very similar here. There's a lot of folks in the audience here. Great, great to see everybody. Uh, a lot of new faces, obviously, students. I, I got you out of class. So. <laughs> 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 uh, so there's something positive here today, if nothing else. You don't have that. Um, um, actually, I have a lot of deep roots in Newport. I was uh, I was actually born in Newport uh, in 1958. Um, my, my dad moved to uh, moved the family down to Brookings in about 1961 or 62. Um, I've um, participated in numerous fisheries in the West Coast. Originally, I started fishing in 1968 when I was nine years old in the uh, salmon troll fishery. 
Um, Albacore uh, tuna fished in uh, 1970, uh, started shrimp fishing in 1977, also uh, crab fishing in the summertime with my brothers. Um, and then I went to the ground fish trawl fishery around 1982, I believe. So a lot of a lot of different hats, and that's the progression I think that uh, Gil talks about as far as how you know moving from one fishery to another. It was uh, I'm, I was not alone. There's a lot of people. One, you graduated from where? Uh, actually, Oregon State University. So I was, uh, <laughs> and actually it was uh, kind of funny because I, for the most part, when I got out of high school, my dad, the first day out of school, I was on the boat, and he always got me back the day before school started. <laughs> And so, uh, really going to college is a great experience, um, and really it was to do something, you know, to do something different. And uh, uh, it was a great uh, uh, lifelong friends and uh, contacts and uh, good education, and uh, really treasure that time. Even though I, I have a business degree from Morgan State, which I guess is applicable to almost everything, but um, it's uh, it was it was a good time, and uh, and I hope you uh, hope you guys uh, utilize your degree and you, you enjoy the, the friendships you have uh, from that experience. So. Anyway, so uh, my talk today is about the uh, industry perspective on West Coast groundfish, or how I learned to uh, stop worrying and learn to uh, love stock uh, synthesis. Um, we'll start by basically talking about um, start by my first work with the Control Commission about 2003, um, and right right prior to that, my taking that position, uh, and I should point out that how bad things how bad things were in 2002 2003. Um, in 2000, the uh, Secretary of uh, Commerce declared the graphic uh, fishery disaster. Um, it was uh, uh, the, the limits were very, very low. Um, shrimp prices were, as far as people who also fish the uh, shrimp fishery, uh, market was horrible. Prices were extremely low. Um, crab seasons weren't that good, um, and it really was nobody to make no money, and it was just really kind of a hopeless situation. And so, actually, I, I, I became the Oregon Troll Commission director. Be, um, I did that, or I got that job, and if I didn't get that job, I probably would have stayed fishing. And my brother was going to get a job on a, at the, uh, the uh, prison down in Crescent City, California, just across the border, because there just wasn't much money in the fishery. And there was really, really no hope amongst the, the whole, uh, across, the, um, across the industry. Um, anyway, um, I think it's interesting to say, or see the, uh, the, uh, as far as the ground fish collapse, as far as what the reason for that. Uh, basically, uh, Penny Dalton, the NIMPS uh, director, talked about how the basic lack of uh, basic scientific uh, data about uh, fish was uh, one of the main reasons. And also, it's really important, I think, of this talk is to talk about um, they would like to work with fishermen, um, and we'll you'll see why that was. Uh, here's this talk to proceeds. Um, so, how bad was it? Um, well, that's kind of the, the uh, what would, I guess the graph. I guess the uh, Secretary of Commerce may have, may have looked at when he made his declaration. Um, obviously, a lot of stocks were fish status, um, and actually, it got worse from there. Um, 2002, so we got another round of uh, uh, some more assessments came in, and uh, um, not a very pretty picture. Um, this year's landings um, on the west coast: uh, the blue line is overall in the, in the ground fish trawl fishery. Um, and then this is non-whiting, so this is just soles, rock, uh, rockfish, sablefish. Uh, if you look at it, it's about let's see, 110,000 metric tons, about almost. A quarter of a billion pounds a year were coming in, um, and then by uh, 2000 we're down to about uh, 85 million pounds, and it went down from there a bunch. Um, so just not a great place to be in. Anyway, so on top of that, um, we really uh, got attacked by a lot of the NGOs who were not very happy with the trawl, the ground fish trawl fishery, um, and it was um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of hype. I think it's. The industry is talking about clear cutting the forest to catch a squirrel, but for the most part, if you're familiar with the trawl fishery, we're basically going over the same spot over and over again every year. We go, always go back to the same spot. So I guess we're clear cutting those every year. But anyway, um, a, a lot of uh, bad press, and we certainly had um, baggage. I mean, obviously, um, almost that much baggage, actually, comes right down to it. Um, but we had a lot of issues that we need to deal with, and under the system we had, we really couldn't do it. A lot of them, we had a lot, of, a lot of discards, a lot of regulatory discards. Uh, which I would say that most of the fleet just, I mean, no, sorry, everybody hated that, that, uh, that happening. Um, but the, really the, the system we had really wasn't made up to, uh, wasn't made to uh, be conservative. Uh, because if you have 50 different species and you hit bump up the limit, you stop fishing or you keep fishing and throw some fish overboard. I mean, just not just a horrible situation. Um, and also there's some habitat concerns that weren't being addressed. And so <clears throat> the good thing about 
when you're at the bottom, there's no place to put up, right? And so the fleet had been working on a number of issues over time. Uh, in 94, before 2000, uh, de uh, declaration, um, we had a, um, a uh, um, limit entry program where we dropped from over 500 ground fish trawlers in the West Coast down to about 350. Um, about 100 of those, about 70, 80, 70, 80 of those permits got bought up by the um, whiting fishery out of Alaska, or the whiting, um, the pollock fishery out of Alaska, so they could have a catcher processor fleet uh, offshore catching whiting. So that got to reduce the, the pool down to about 270 permits. Um, the science had been increased uh, or gotten much, much, much better. Uh, we had the FRAM survey was just started as far as 2003. The coastwide survey from 30 pounds out to 700 was going. Um, rebuilding plans were largely in place. Um, and in 2003, we also began the rationalization of the trawl fishery. We're basically all about doing individual accountability, individual accountability to everybody. And then also a lot of innovation in gear selectivity. Um, uh, there was a selective flatfish trawl that was allowed people to fish on the shelf without catching rockfish, which were, uh, were deemed to be overfished. But, uh, but also what happened, the good thing was that uh, the 1999 year class, if anybody's familiar with that, uh, as far as looking back at history, that was a, um, took everybody by surprise. The 2003 um, frame survey saw it, and it really kind of just set everybody back as by how much fish they saw. Um, that was, the, I believe, from the, uh, the big El Nino 98, 99, the cold water, and it really just jump-started the entire coast. Um, but there really was kind of a, um, a realization that we didn't get into this situation overnight. I mean, uh, these fish take a long, uh, they, they live a long time. We don't catch that much in a given year, but over time you can uh, not knock that fishery down. But if you do, it takes a long time to bring them back up. So we realized that we're going to be here for the long term. Um, so in 2006, uh, with uh, help from uh, well, number, numerous people in this, this room, uh, we established uh, essential fish habitat protections, um, and then uh, also we uh, uh, the catch share program came online in 2011. And the 2000 catch share program was uh, great in a lot of ways, uh, conservation wise. We had 100% observer coverage. I know if, uh, I'm sure most of you in this room know that uh, there's an observer uh, or a camera on every ground fish trawler on the west coast. So every um, so they see basically there's no uh, no unknown removals. Um, and with that, the fleet becomes 100% accountable. And so uh, and I, and when that happens, people change behaviors. And so uh, in, in a good way. Um, discard of target species dropped to less than 5%. And I, think I was talking to uh, Brad uh, Warren, who was uh, editor of Pacific Fishing Magazine uh, for a number of years. And he said, man, that is your rock star status. He just blew him away. I think it blew a lot of people away, actually, what we could do. And so, uh, um, and because really, when, you, when the removals are fully known, that's a huge unknown taken out of the equation, and it really helps uh, helps guide us as far as dictating what we're going to have for future quotas. Um, anyway, so we're going along here, and so we have uh, obviously that 2000 uh, or the 99 year class. You know, it was starting to see up, show up in the industry, uh, and we're starting to see lots of fish, um, uh, dramatic increases in catch, um, and really we. Um, we never really got credit from the things that we had done. I mean, basically, you know, we rationalized the fishery, we reduced the fleet, um, and we're still getting beat up. And then from the industry pers perspective, it was like this guy here, it's almost like whack-a-mole, right? And it's, um, it just, it just, like we never got recognition, and it was pretty damn frustrating as a, as a, as a, as a fleet, as, as individuals. Um, you do the right thing, and you're not getting credit for it. Um, even though, like I say, the, um, the National Academy of Science, uh, there's uh, 2000 or 2002, they had a, a study or a, uh, um, uh, they had a, a report on, on trawling and said basically that do three things to um, minimize or uh, mitigate uh, any impacts from trawling. You reduce the fleet, you close areas, and you modify gear. And we've done, we've done all that and, and more, I thought. And so um, it was pretty frustrating. So. Um, as an example, um, in Monterey, um, Monterey Bay Aquarium, as people are very familiar with the seafood watch list, um, they had rockfish listed as red listed as caught by a trawl, and sole was yellow listed. Um, even though, so we know all these uh, um, constraints in place, and in the, in the same toad they're catching the sole with the rockfish, they had red listed rockfish. So the fishermen in Monterey Bay, they couldn't sell their fish to the local places because it was red listed, which is anyway. So it was just kind of kind of a crazy um, um, same gear, same toe. One is one is it. So we decided to do something different. And like as um, as Gil pointed out, um, 
we decided to go forward with the uh, MSC uh, certification of the fishery. And um, I think what happened, I think, is we lost the high ground. I think the agency had lost the high ground in a lot of ways. And uh, so we had to find a way to reclaim that. And um, I had um, familiar, familiar with the MSC program from the ship fishery, which we had rationalized or certified in 2007. Um, and I understood what that certification means and what it looks at. Um, because really, as a resource extractor, you know, fisherman, um, we have a social contract to do what we do. And I think most people, they kind of lose sight of that. And sometimes you have to renew that social contract. And to me, that's what the MSC certification meant. Because if that, the gold standard in the world for certification, if they're good with it, everybody else should be too. And so um, we went, uh, I, I talked to my guys and they're going uh, forward with that. Um, and there were a lot of doubters, as, as uh, Gil uh, mentioned, but I, I understood uh, that um, what the, what, what's in the MSC's three principles, stock health, management of the fishery, and the effects of the fishery. And really the, um, the council process we have is almost, it's perfect because it looks at every single thing uh, in depth. And um, it was, uh, uh, we checked every box, virtually every box. Um, so um, anyway, so we, um, uh, we got certified in 2014. And so um, anyway, we certified 13 species, the biggest certification species wise in the world. Um, we had more information than ever seen before in one fishery. Uh, kind of blew them away. It took a long time to uh, to do it. Um, a lot of uh, um, yeah, actually, I said having three scientists. They actually had five to, to go through it all. Um, anyway, so we had uh, some great press from that. So we're doing a little bit of vindication as far as uh, what we'd seen uh, the previous uh, decade. Um, and. Uh, or they even took us off their red list. And actually, we're still kind of on the red list, but if you notice on the fine print on the right, it talks about excludes Marine Stewardship Council certified fisheries. So I guess that was kind of a... Anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it was, a, um, it, David, it, was a, it was a big day for the fishery, a big, 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 a big day for me personally to get that done. Um, and actually, um, I got a call from uh, one of my processor um, processors in the West Coast. Actually, one of my was my commissioners, and uh, around this time, and he got a call from um, Whole Foods, and Whole Foods was doing a, a national advertising campaign, their very first, and they wanted to have a um, they want to have a fishery um, in, in that, and they wanted to highlight Oregon fishery. Well, that's got to be shrimp, right? I mean, first sort of shrimp fishery, it's all good. Um, nope, they wanted to do MSC ground fish, which kind of I mean, to talk about. If you look at the Whole Foods and who they are, the ground fish fishery, trawl fishery, um, to get them to say that, you got to admit the MSC certification pulled a lot of weight and actually uh, it, it convinced folks that um, help, it, it did everything I envisioned it would do. Um, and so if we could, I'm going to play uh, two, uh, two uh, uh, commercials. The first one is the anthem, just one second, um, 2014 first game of the World Series displayed. So think about that. I mean, the, I don't know how much that would cost, but it would be far less than we paid for that certification. So. That's it. Yep. We are hungrier for better than we ever realized. We want to know where our food comes from. We care what happens to it along the way. We want to trust our sources. We want people and animals and the places our food comes from to be treated fairly. The time is ripe to champion the way food is grown and raised and caught. So it's good for us. And for the greater good too. This is where it all comes to fruition. This is where values matter. Whole Foods Market, America's healthiest grocery store. That was probably the best day of my professional life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then this is the, they have a seafood, um, this is their seafood, nope. Yeah, that's it. I know. Oh. Playing the other one. Oh. <laughs> Drive in a <laughs> Whole Foods Market values matter. 
So we're transparent about the fresh wild seafood we sell and the species we don't. Independently rated for sustainability, traceable from dock to store. Sent fresh from over 50 U.S. fisheries with responsible fishing practices. Like Bornstein Seafood. Because to us, value is inseparable from value. Whole Foods Market, America's healthiest grocery store. All right. Hey. Okay, so where were we at? We're right at. Oh, no, no, right here. Right here. All right. We're back in. All right. All right. All right. So, um, that vessel was an Oregon troll vessel out of Warrington. Um, skipper is Kevin Dunn, who sits on the Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel. A uh, great guy, works a lot of uh, excluders, uh, a lot of gear work himself. Um, he um, um, was a great uh, ambassador, I think, in the whole process. Um, but it's interesting, did anybody notice anything about that picture? Or the, uh, that, um, Anything stand out in the, that, that, uh, those, those videos as far as the fishing side? Um. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fine print in the contract <laughs> that Whole Foods signed and did, and, and, and did, not, um, did not realize that. So Kevin was thought, well, he's just going to go out and he, was, he knew a place where he get like about 5,000 pounds to a tow patrol. He'd, he'd knock it out and bring it in and boom, and it'd be done. And so um, they had this conundrum because they actually couldn't catch fish and kill them when they put them on the boat, making that thing. So more steam seafoods froze, I don't know, 5,000 pounds of fish and IQF'd them. And then they brought them down the boat and they shoveled them into the cot end. Through the Parker Street, they rolled that baby off. <laughs> so anyway, it was... Um, it was it was pretty funny, uh, <laughs> but really, I mean, it's um, uh, it's kind of cool because a, an Oregon troll vessel, groundfish troll vessel, was held up as the example of sustainable fisheries in the United States, and uh, that's really um, that, that's really because a lot of people uh, in this state, in this room, uh, were, did a lot of work to get, to get us there, and so it's um, it's you know they have, they have those raising kids. It takes a village by only to to, uh, to uh, manage a fishery. And there's a lot of people. I'm, he talks about that uh, the uh, White House deal, and it's a great honor. It really was, but uh, the really it's just I. Somebody, they had to identify somebody to represent everybody involved. And I just happened to be the guy who got the short straw on that. Although it was pretty cool, I will say that it was pretty cool. <laughs> but really, my talk, um, um, I guess we love to work with fisheries right now. But really, I need to go back in time a little bit to the um, to uh, the seventies, where disco was uh, king, and uh, along with salmon. And really get a perspective as far as how we got to where we were as far as the, the science the side of things. Um, in the mid 70s, the Magnuson Act uh, passes, right? Um, the shrimp fishery became fully developed. Um, I think uh, in the early, late 70s, early 80s, I think it was like 300 ground fish, or no, uh, shrimp trawlers on the Oregon coast made landings. 300. Give you an idea of like 75 in the last 10 years. Um, the Triennial Survey, um, the NIMS, um, the really the first ground, the first real groundfish survey they, they, uh, they started was 77 to 2001. They did kind of the most of the coast, um, and actually that was a Alaska class vessel that uh, had a, a three bridle high rise net with bobbins, no disc in between uh, the bobbins. And originally it was going to be a rockfish survey, and they worked worth a damn for that. I think mean, maybe Hake survey, then a rockfish survey, then they just made the Triennial Survey for everything. And it really was just a horrible, um, horrible way to um, survey uh, ground fish in its entirety. Um, we also had a major El Nino in 82, 83. And I think everybody thinks that the 80, 97, 98 was a big one. Um, I think the 82, 83 was bigger as far as the impacts of ground fish. Um, and then um, from that, El Nino became the buildup of the ground fish trawl fleet. Because all the shrimpers, because shrimp goes away when you have a big El Nino. And so landings drop precipitously, like, down like, I mean, we average 25 million pounds a year. We're down like 4 million, I think. 
And so everybody is running into the, the ground fish trawl fleet. Um, I was fishing out of Coos Bay in 1982 or three, that, that time frame, 83. And uh, there was 50, over 50 trawl vessels in Coos Bay alone. Uh, it's just amazing how many, everybody's just piling in on it. So anyway, which kind of got us to where we got in 2000. But anyway, also the Alaska um, Fishery Science Center slope survey begins because the, the Trinal survey only went out to 180 fathoms or something like that. And that was trying to, they're trying to find, with, with the big boats, the Miller Freeman, they're trying to look at the ways to um, assess those other stocks. Um, anyway, so... Um, so our stock assessments, um, for the most part, there's a general lack of faith in the process by the fleet. Um, um, the survey had real issues. Um, there's a lot of complaints about the model. Um, and um, so I've talked about, talk about you know, ivory tower as far as the scientists that are up over here now. They're really not really talking to the, the, the fishermen and they don't know anything. Not much communication going on. And... Um, Every tower like that, so it's always good. To, I, I looked a long time to find that uh, the right one, so I think that's a good every tower. But really, um, um, if you've uh, <laughs> the reality was that that uh, if you've ever been to Mont Lake, um, that's not quite the Mont Lake, tab, <laughs> but it's not very far from that, at least during that time period. So um, <laughs> I tried to get one of the original what they had back there before they condemned them because of the mold, but it was. Um, uh, but uh, I think if you ever you got there, the notion went away pretty uh, pretty quickly about every tower. Um, anyway, but uh, with that, there's just a like, lot of frustration in the process. And really, it was mostly over uh, the species right here, sablefish. That was probably the one that really drove. You know, sablefish was part of the, the, the uh, DTS complex, uh, pretty very valuable uh, fish uh, species. Um, and really, um, no one's like they don't want to talk in, and uh, there's all the cubation going on. And I, I think that's probably, probably a pretty good uh, picture as far as where everybody's coming from. No one's really seeing the same picture. Um, and actually, um, um, one guy actually kind of started this, built this log jam to get things going, and um, that's this guy. And so that's, uh, you know, I, I showed this picture yesterday, I was in a meeting with him, the, on the, uh, I'm on a cable committee meeting, uh, on a cable committee in Oregon, and he's been, with, I've been with him 20 years plus, and um, he was uh, not happy because he, uh, he's, his, 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 what he was saying is, how come the fish I'm throwing away, you're not seeing that survey boat? And so he got in his car and he drove to uh, Sand Point. And he went up there and said, hey, I want to talk to the fisherman's rep on that, on that, on that survey boat. And so um, <laughs> he was, uh, well, the, it was Gary Stauffer, I think. And uh, Gary says, well, we don't have a fisherman's rep on that boat. And so um, he says, so, well, he says, you, uh, you want to go? And so, um, and he says, yeah, I do. So he made a, eventually made four or five 10 day trips on the Miller Freeman, that vessel right there. And uh, it was pretty apparent uh, early on from the fishermen that he uh, saw there's issues. Um, the doors are too small, the wire is way too big. Um, the net would start spreading from the first part of the 30 minute tow, I think. It'd be 17 meters of spread. And by the time they finished up, they'd have eight meters of spread, which was the width of the boat. And so it was obviously the gear wasn't working. And um, anyway, he, uh, he shared that information to the fleet. And that got the fleet stirred up because they're all seeing the same thing he's seeing. That's so what's, what's the fleet do? They pick up the phone and they start calling and they start, I mean, it's, it's a big deal. Um, and so uh, what we basically, did, what we needed was um, better information. And so with that, they put pressure to go uh, to, well, that pressure led to the pilot, uh, oops, there it is, the uh, pilot trawl survey with industry vessels. And so, um, so now we had industry working with, with the, the agency. And um, I'm not saying there wasn't a few issues at first. There were, obviously, every, every, uh, every survey. Um, um, but they, and I think some guys were kind of joking about there's almost a, um, they called it a bottle hunt because the gear was, was digging because it wasn't adjusted properly. And so, um, um, and, and the industry wanted to use a two seam net, which is the kind of Eastern, which a lot of guys, most guys use. Uh, the agency wanted to use a four seam net. Uh, which is probably a better net realistically. I think we probably uh, come out right, but ultimately led to um, the Fram survey, in which we do right now. So I think we get from like 90, well, 2003 to um, well this year, we've got industry vessels from 35 them out to 700. And we've got a great time series, and it's um, it's really worked out well. Uh, so we didn't have that. We didn't get there by itself. 
it happened fairly organically with pressure the fleet, and um, we, we got to a good happy place, I think, for the most part. Um, a few thoughts on the um, Fram survey. It's very cost effective. Um, industry vessels, um, we have four vessels normally. This year we're only down to two. Uh, so we're probably going to have to go back, pick up the phone and go back to DC and try to get that fixed. Um, but we've got 20, almost 20 years of, uh, of landings. That's a, a time series like that is worth a lot. Um, it really is. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's very well thought out sampling protocols. It has uh, random, uh, random blocks it hits. Um, like there's 700 blocks um, up and down the coast from the Canadian border to Mexico. Um, it matches the gear with the right size vessel. Um, and really it facilitates the, um, the communication between fishermen and the scientific community. Uh, you basically for, you know, for four plus months, you get industry with scientists sitting down talking um, and breaking bread. And um, I think there's a lot of advantage that we just don't, uh, you just don't get from anything else. And, and really, it builds a lot of trust in the fleet because they know that they're, the fleet's working with the agency uh, to make it right. Um, anyway, so um, it's really great, I, excuse me, a really great example of how to partner with the um, uh, agency to partner with the fishing industry to improve management. And it stands in contrast to a place that I visited um, about a year, a year, a year and a half ago. And that would be, if people are familiar with that, that is uh, the, the uh, Carlos Boats yeah. in New England. Um, I was in the New Bedford about a year and a half ago um, on an EM workshop. I think it was last year. We get old time flies. Um, anyway, we're trying to increase accountability, accountability in the ground fish fleet. They have very low observer rates, 6 or 7%, something like that. Um, they have not much trust in the, fish, or the fishery side to what the, the stock successes are saying. Um, um, they got industry, uh, the, the, the big white boats doing the, the surveys, um, and it's just really a huge disconnect. And um, it's really sad because they had, we had our trawl gate in the, the mid 90s when uh, Gerald went back out on the, on the uh, Miller Freeman and saw what was going on. Made a big row, the industry got together, put pressure on it, and changes were made. And everybody got on board, I think, to, a, to the betterment of everybody. Um, New England had a trawl gate in 2002, very similar. But nothing got done. Nothing changed, and that's really, um, really um, telling because really they come to that, that path in the road. Are you going to go the right way or are you going to go the wrong way? And I, I think on the West Coast, we took the right. I think they took the left because they also rationalized. They've got a um, catch share program themselves. Um, it was more forced on them because they weren't doing the things they need to do. Um, and so, but the problem, the, the problem that is is there's a parallel track. You got science and you got management and they have to go hand in hand. And what happened with us is we started, we got our science corrected or on the right path early on prior to being rationalized. And so um, when you have a rationalized fishery, you're 100% accountable and you have, but within a day, you know what you, you caught. Um, you need really good science to feed that. And so if you get in a rationalized fishery like the East Coast right now when their science isn't very good, and they probably don't have a very good handle what's in the water, um, you can shut that fishery down immediately. That's why they have 6% observer coverage, because no one wants to be an observer, because they see more fish than the, the, the sauce that are seeing. And so for us, um, we made the right decision. We improved our science, we got it on the right path, and then over a period of time, we got rationalized. So now we have a, a scientific uh, system or, 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 or an assessment system in place that is far better than we had, and it can handle a 100% a, a accountable fishery. I'm not sure what they're going to do in New England. It's going to be really hard because how do you show them that fish is there? I think that um, if you look at, what, I had someone asked me, what, what would New England do if they had a Fram survey, a time series like, like we have, 20 years of what we got? I mean, there's, there's a it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars to think about because there's a lot of fish being stranded in the water, uh, and there's a situation. I don't know how they're going to get out of it. I just, I just know that. Just you know, we had on this, this, on this uh, fish or this coast, we are much more homogenous. I, I'd say we're kind of like mutts here in the West Coast, right, for the most part. But back, in, I mean, um, there's no. Um, I think on the East Coast you have Italians, you have the Portuguese, and they're very isolated as far as I don't, I don't think they talk that to, that much to each other, and there's fairly. Um, I think the, the communities are kind of isolated, Portugal isolated between each other. I, I can't get a feeling for that. 
Here, when we went through our process, we had uh, like the Fishermen's Market Association was like 250 boats belong to it. So we had one voice going in the right direction to fix things. And so there was a, um, it, was, it was hard to push back against that when the majority of the fleet is wanting something to get done. And there really was no one voice in the East Coast I, I didn't see pushing those changes to be made. Um, so anyway, um, I tell you what, I feel really glad that I'm from the West Coast because uh, I think we're about to solve the problem. So I think we're in a pretty good position. And uh, it's, um, I really feel bad for the folks back in the East Coast. I'm not sure how they're going to get out of that. I really, I really don't. Um, so the future, I think, for the West Coast is pretty bright. Um, Groundfish stocks are in great shape. Um, if you look at the across the board, um, they probably average about 65 or 70 percent of B0. Uh, so pretty, pretty good shape for the most part. Um, the biology of groundfish is very um, advantageous because we only take a little bit out of the water each, each year. You got El Nino, uh, warm water. You know, you can handle those. Um, unproductive periods far better uh, with a long-lived species, as long as you're not taking too much out of the water. Um, I mean, catch shares are inherently uh, precautionary um, because we are very seldom ever uh, approach a, um, a, uh, the quota limit. Um, and I think a long time, a long time, a long time series control survey is, it's like money in the bank. And that's why uh, we're very protective of that. And we're hoping to uh, take it four boats on the water next year because we can handle a year or two of only two boats, but at some point in time that, that information can degrade and uh, that'll be a bad deal if that happens. Um, on top of that, technology is advancing rapidly. Um, I should talk to the folks in the agency talk about like environmental DNA, I guess, right? I mean, if it's a water sample and you find out everything that's in the water, I mean, it's, um, they got ways to go with that, but it's kind of crazy what we, uh, technology can do for us. Um, and really, the relationship between the science industry is good. I think it can be better. Uh, but I think we have a really good um, uh, working relationship, and we're, uh, we're uh, happy to, uh, um, well, I think we're, um, anything we do to make that better, we're willing to do it. And uh, our, our, our doors are always open. Um, but there are some storm clouds in the distance. I think that um, our fisheries depend on sound science. Um, and I think there's a danger of complacency. And I think that that, um, I guess, sort of that FRAM survey, I think it's really a big deal. Uh, because it's like, say, we can get by a year or two. Yeah, we probably can. But um, at some point in time, it's going to be an issue. Um, funding will not be any easier. Um, I know I'd, I'd point out that, uh, for an example, um, California uh, was, does not, has not been doing their sampling of um, the dockside sampling of like Lincoln um, leading up to the 2000, well, last year's assessment of uh, Southern Lincoln. It went, that assessment went into um, or that species went in the, set of the star panel at about 75%. Um, it looked really good, big big jump in, in, the, in the quota. And then they're going through the information and they'll say, well, gee, you don't have any link data because they haven't done the port sampling. And so basically they got stripped out and that thing went down to oh, like 33%. And so they, they're, they're, they're cutting back their quotas. And that, that was pressure on everybody else because other sectors, because some sectors want, that, want the fish they should have got. Um, and so it's just create, creating a, um, a lot of stress potentially uh, with everybody. Uh, and really, I just highlight that everybody in this process works their ass off, pardon the expression, doing the right thing. And really, one weak link in that chain can just screw everything up. And I think we all, we all should be mindful of that. Um, and so with that, agencies need to count the cost and basically make wise decisions as far as how those resources are, added or are allocated. And so, um, and so I'd like to finish this uh, talk with a um, talk about these guys here. So a lot of folks near retirement. A lot of young folks are going to go into this, uh, this business and um, really like to hold these guys up. Uh, if you don't know them, uh, it's too bad. Uh, you should, if you're seeing the docs or they're around, you ought to. They're just great folks. Um, one on the left is Bob Hanna, the right is Steve Jones, a long time fishery biologist, working for Fish and Wildlife. Um, and um, they ran the SHRP program for the ODFW. And I don't think people realize that these guys here are probably responsible solely for saving the uh, shrimp fishery in the West Coast, and you don't even know about it. Um, they started working on the bycatch reduction in the early 90s, uh, soft panels, playing around, just didn't have much money, but they just saw an issue. At that, time, at that point in time, we're catching a lot of hake, a lot, a lot of hake bycatch in the shrimp fishery. I think some years as high as 60% of the catch was hake in that fishery. Um, so it worked out every, every year, and it's about right, 2002, I think they'd actually come up with the, uh, the rigid grape uh, um, as a bycatch reduction device, it worked really well. That was really good because in 2002, the canary fish or the canary stalks 
were declared overfished and that the total catch of canary at the west coast is 44 metric tons. Mind you that the catch of canary rockfish in the 10, 15 years earlier was four, 5,000 tons. So you've got the fishery constrained all fisheries to 40 ton of, of canary rockfish. Uh, on an average year, I think they'd catch 25, on a, uh, sometimes up to the highest 50 ton. Uh, that fishery would have been closed down without those two guys doing the work they did, collaborating with the, collaboratively with the fleet. Um, also, they worked on um, um, LED lights with uh, Mark Lavelli right there, Mark, who um, basically was uh, kind of helped us jump another uh, another uh, get, uh, uh, another obstacle, and that was the Unicon smelt. Um, in uh, in um, British Columbia, that fishery there gets shut down every year uh, because of um, Unicon bycatch, and so uh, a lot of um, the tribes uh, on the on the Columbia River were pushing together, uh, listed as an endangered species. Uh, it was listed like 2000 and 11, 12? Anyway, okay. Anyway, um, and so that means that, uh, that we had to uh, be very mindful how much uh, snow was being caught. So the grates, the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife went to a, a three quarter inch grate. So anything bigger than the three quarter inches would go out the top. Um, and that, uh, and that, uh, that got our, our, our bycatch down by 60, 70, 80%, which still catch a lot, I guess, in the grand scheme of things when, to some folks. Uh, put us in kind of dire straits uh, for that fishery because uh, we were number three, I think, um, number three on the list of the uh, impacts to the, the stock, even though it was minor compared to um, to the land issues. Um, and then the, the, uh, with Mark's help, uh, those uh, with Bob and uh, Steve uh, threw LED lights in the photo open, and lo and behold, uh, eliminate 90% of the bycatch. Uh, the, the, the level they had taken out with the, um, they were excluding 70% of the Ulicon, the lice took out another 90% of bycatch was removed. So it's anyway, probably the biggest bycatch reduction success maybe in the country ever in the fisheries, I would say. Um, anyway, so that's, um, um, so I guess moving forward, I'd say that there, even though um, you could do, you could do a lot, um, or basically you could do, and don't undersell yourself as far as your impacts to uh, fisheries. Uh, and I would encourage you to, um, if you're working in fisheries, to look at the fleet. Um, they have a vested interest to make sure this goes right, long-term interest. And I think that um, it just makes uh, everything better in the long run. And so, um, anyway, um, I think that's I think that's it. I think it is. So, anyway, thank you. So, no questions? <laughs> So I just wanted to make one comment. So I was on the SSC when Gerald Gunnery, Dave, you were on the SSC as well, when Gerald Gunnery uh, was off, was uh, uh, observing <laughs> how NOAA was doing it. And so it wasn't just going to DC. Actually, the council and, and NIMS did a formal review, scientific review, of how NIMS was doing its Paul survey. And they invited outside scientists in to do a formal review. So, and they discovered, and they said, yeah, the survey was not very good. <laughs> it was, I think they said even harsher terms than that. <laughs> and NIMS didn't like getting rid of it. They said, you're going to have to get rid of the whole data set. Of course, people in, in you know, NIMS and NOAA, they don't want to get rid of a data, a long data set. But they said it wasn't, wasn't very good. The other thing, you did go to DC. Not only did you go to D.C., but you brought D.C. out here. So Congressman Wyden came out and had a formal sub because he was kind of a small business. He had a subcommittee on small business. So he came out here and actually had a meeting with the fleet. I remember I was sitting in the back, and, and he said, what? Are you telling me that, there, that NIMS is not working with you and using your vessels to help do the best survey possible? We got to do something about that, and I've never seen staffers write as fast. <laughs> he made that comment, and and so it was a kind of a two multi-pronged effort to to develop a really sound yeah. survey in a collaborative way. So, okay. having said that, let's open up for questions. I'm sure there's quite a few. My question is: um, a couple of years ago, I think it was Yellowwise. Some of these fish are banned, and I don't know if just charter fishing or commercial fishing. And if you if you how do you not catch yellow eye? I guess my question, what happens if you do? Well, thankfully, yellow eye is um, limited to pretty rough rough habitat. 
And so uh, one of the things that the council did in 2002 uh, when Canary Rockfish were declared uh, overfished was that they, uh, uh, we went to an 8-inch fur rope and so uh, for 100 fathoms and in. And so basically that keeps you out of the hard ground. Um, so now with 100% accountability for the, for the patrol vessels, even though we have 8-inch fur rope, uh, they might try to go in some hard ground, but why would you? Because there's only, well, up until this year, there's only two point, well, 20, a metric ton of, of yellow white the entire uh, trawl fleet. So people just try to stay away from that kind of habitat. And now, dealing with the non-trawl fisheries, um, it is, you can't land it uh, because they're only targeting of it. Um, but that quota has been increased, uh, I think, the uh, by, I think, for double, I believe, for the, um, uh, um, recreational and well, all the non-trawl sectors, I should say, and so, but that's still an issue. Uh, but the stock is looking way better. It's going to be rebuilt in ten years. Uh, but realistically, they're in the hard ground. And how do you assess the hard ground? The, the trawl survey is not very good for that species, right? They don't catch that many. Uh, but there are a lot of things happening with the agency here. ODFW is doing a lot of work in video landers, and they're seeing some promising stuff, I think, on that. So there are a lot of things in the pipeline to try to, to address those species that live in that kind of habitat. Um, but as far as as far as the non-trawl fishery, which is 100% observer coverage, um, they're not allowing any landings or any landings of those species because to just to uh, minimize uh, any targeting. Pat, Patrick. <laughs> Yeah. Decades. Yeah. What do you think trawl fishery will look like in the next ten? Ooh. Um, I'm hoping to see some more spe specialization. I think. Um, right now the markets aren't that good. I mean, um, prior to the catch year or, or prior to the uh, disaster declaration, um, imports to this fishery uh, were not near where, where they are now. So really, the, we, the, the people who've grown up on farm-raised products or imports, right? Farm-raised and imports both. And so um, really we're in the process of reintroducing those species in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we had like 30, 35 million pounds of rockfish delivered to the West Coast last year, which is the biggest, most, most in well over 20 years. Um, I think there's a lot of market penetration there, but the prices really aren't that good even yet. Um, so, and, uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I don't know if we get into that, but I, I think that um, we need to get the value of this fishery up and if we do, you see some investment uh, in that. Um, a lot of, I mean, we did a really good job of rebuilding stocks in a short period of time. But outside of Oregon, who's been very, as I say, pro trawl very pro-industry, um, you know, our landings look historically are actually looking pretty good for Oregon. But about 60% of all groundfish landings in the West Coast are in Oregon. Uh, but so there's a lot of states really fall, or not where they should be. And a lot of infrastructure is gone. I mean, I, I like, I, I could say with a lot of confidence that it's probably harder to process, catch and process uh, fish in California south of 4010 than it is in a third world country. Because they're just, there's no, it's so expensive, right? Those, those infrastructures went away and it's been developed and it's just so hard to get it back because there's just so much money involved. It's worth so much money to some, to, to some other endeavor. And so um, it's really a, a tough situation. So, Brad, you might mention positively groundfish as a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, when um, the 2000, uh, when 2016, when the new numbers come out for the, um, for like we had tremendous increases in um, um, in rockfish quotas, um, we um, had a meeting here in Newport actually for the uh, Bay Trawl Commission meeting. And we basically had all the industry folks in the same room, um, processors, industry. Gil, you were there. Um, with the environmental groups saying, "Hey, we've got all this fish in the water, and how are we going to get it out? Because you just don't turn that spigot on. It just doesn't work." And so from that, we've started a um, a nonprofit to promote uh, ground fish. It's called Positively Ground Fish. We want a, a positive name. It's got ground fish in it, and we succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so we've hired a, a fantastic uh, individual, uh, maybe Anna Henning, who had uh, 10 years of uh, work in corporate uh, marketing in uh, the UK, who, um, who uh, after working at the London Olympics for, uh, for a year uh, prior to it, uh, the Games, I took so much time off, went down to a fisheries, like Ceylon or Madagascar, someplace, four or five months of volunteering for a fishery improvement project, and uh, she fell in love with fisheries, and uh, she actually uh, went to Stanford, or got a master's degree in marine studies, and uh, so she's applying that uh, newfound uh, love for the, uh, the, the, the for fisheries, and uh, she's been our uh, director. She's doing a fantastic job. So uh, anyway, so we had to, the process involved that, fishermen, um, OSU, um, 
you know, um, uh, EDF, MSC. MSC. Uh, anyway, so it's uh, been really exciting some of the stuff we've been doing. And actually, it's interesting. I don't know, has anybody ate raw rockfish? Raw. Raw. Well, I, have, I tell you what, I, I think it, shame on me and probably shame on the rest of the fleet, never probably underestimating what we're catching. Um, because uh, we've been, uh, we've been four, four shows this year, I think. We did the Port of Seafood Wine Festival, kind of get her feet, you know, wet and see how things went. And then uh, there was, uh, she went to uh, the Anaheim uh, Natural Food Show, big show with 60, 70,000 people. And then Boston Seafood Show, which I went back there and helped her. And the Northwest Food Service Show. And so they've been serving rockfish crudo. And so basically it's uh, like a little, kind of little slice off of a raw, raw, rockfish filet, a um, little sea salt, some greens, a little seasoning, and some, like, and some brown butter. A little bit of brown butter on that thing. And I'm telling you what. Shame on me, because that is absolutely crazy. I mean, I've been on zillions of shows, right? I, before I was the director of the Troll Commission, as a fisherman, I was actually a, on the Crab Commission for 10 years. I, heck, I was the chair when we started going on the MSC certification of the Crab Fishery before I took on the, the, the Troll Commission job. And um, the, the result, I see people try that dish, that, that raw rockfish. It's the same look that people give me when, um, when you had the, the, the first time someone's tasted a Dungeness cra uh, Crab Fry Leg. It's just that good. And so, I mean, really, it, 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 you want to have good fish, you just have it raw. And so, I mean, actually, I know it's greenies, but they're, they're doing brownies, which really kind of threw me off. Uh, so, um, anyway, a lot of positive stuff about happening. Uh, there's some uh, Japanese folks came to um, Bornstein's market, or uh, the seafood plant up in Bellingham, and they're talking about different species, and they said, well, what do you play? I said, well, you know, rockfish, huh? could we try some? So we went down and got a flay, chopped it up, here's the bowl, some chopsticks, they're mowing us and wow, this is crazy good. What is it? Well, it's Widow Rock. Widow Rock. We think about that. There's no name for Widow Rock in Japan. I guess that would be the that would be the fish of your dead spouse. <laughs> so, so, so I mean, there's probably things marketing wise. I mean, we're thinking about that. What do you? Maybe we should rename it. <laughs> of course, uh, hey, well, Hank Whiting, right? Of course, you can't call it Golden Rock fish because you already got that. There's, there's 60, 70 different species of rockfish in this West Coast. All the good names are taken, so um, there's a lot of challenges ahead of us. So anyway, I probably went way too long on that part, but please, yes. Yeah, I, I, so my name's Ichan, I'm the academic program manager here from Science. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, want to thank you for your support uh, of our students who are in yes. uh, and studying fisheries science. Yep. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the Gill's students was supported on that, the Hannah Jones Scholarship, yes. which is a, an amazing scholarship that provides Two grand uh, for an MRM student, or yes. really any Oregon student who's interested in marine resource management, uh, fisheries management, right. stuff like that. And uh, uh, the the relationships that that builds is great. The wonderful yep. um, inspiration and, and start that it creates. Unfortunately, it's going to ask for more money. <laughs> well, actually, I was. Um... I was uh, no 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 I was um, I, I was actually thinking about that as I uh, I came in um, and there's a um, if you don't know the the troll commission who had been doing that when I was director um, decided not to do that because they're, they're cutting back expenses and so um, um, that's not lost on me and um, I'll probably want to talk to you afterwards about that because uh, there's other ways we're going to take care of that so that's that's not dead. That's great. Dude. So uh, yeah, is it supported for wonderful students? No, 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 no. I did that. So well, I, I really want to, you know, how those guys did it, right? Very cost effective, fantastic results. Um, you really want to hold that as an example for folks, right? Yes. Uh, because anybody, anybody in this room could do what they did. You've just got to have the vision and you know work with folks and uh, and uh, the potential is there to have the impact they had. So yeah, no, I I totally agree. So we're. Uh, that's going to be a fixed one way or the other. Okay. Um, I will definitely stay out of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Could you go over the East Coast thing again? I, I find it really interesting that where the fishery science has been going the longest, when it was the Bureau of Fishery Management, yeah, yeah. that the process has, has gone awry so much. Yeah, hey, Brad, be careful. I'm Portuguese or I'm from <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. I, I don't claim to be an expert. I just, just kind of my observations, talking to people back there when I was there, um, um, I said recently. And it just, they, they had issues, they never fixed them. And then again, I mean, there's six states, six states in New England? 
and so they had 12 senators. So there's been a lot of money thrown at them, right? I mean, they've had buy, you know, buy buy buyouts. Yeah. They bought bought out part of. Well, they have 1,300 permits, so they buy out. You say 100, there's still 1,200 that they're coming back into it, which was what happened. Um, and it just it's there's just no cohesiveness, I think, in getting the solutions in place. And because they've always had someone bail them out on the other end. And so it's just kind of frustrating to be in a system that you can't succeed in. And so um, it looks to me like, I mean, really, they, they had an opportunity to take care of their science. And it was, and they just never saw it through. And it was just, um, and that, that, that's, that's hurting them today, what they did 20 years ago. It it's actually, the criminality of New Bedford. <laughs> and uh, all of that, <laughs> he's, the, he's by far and away the biggest fleet owner there. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, you know, the mafia used to control the whole fish market. And you, you go up and down the coast, you, you get the feeling that there were other interests other than connecting with the fishery service. You know, that, 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 I, I have no idea what that, I mean, no, all I know is they didn't fix it, and they should have. They should have. Um, I, I hate to comment. I, I'm just not an expert on it. I just know from my experience there, just talking to people, and it's kind of my experience on the West Coast. Um, you know, we saw an issue and we addressed it. And we, I, I, for the most part, were like, you know, like, you know, like a, stuck, our, stuck our teeth into it and just wouldn't let go. And uh, I think bad people bought into what we're trying to do, too, right? We're, we're not asking for the world. We're just trying to, we got here, we're not getting out here overnight. We know that. Let's try to fix this in, uh, in a lot, it's a long term, long term solution. And I guess the good part is acknowledged by everybody. I think basically we're not, this ain't going to get fixed tomorrow. And so that's been really the kind of the, throughout the entire process, I think is there's been patience, but we want to make progress. Yeah. Well, there's got to be some more. I got, I got one. I can probably ask questions all day long. But what exactly does a, an observer do and what is the responsibility? Of well, I mean, in the observer sense, for prior to the catch here program, we had observers on the vessel and they would the document. Um, um, what the discards were, what was kept, and, and what also any um, any um, um, benthic impacts, right? If there's any coral, if there's any you know sea pins, whatever would be anything that, that would, the boat would catch. Um, when they decided to go down an observer on every boat, we were the fleet was thinking just a catch accounting, right? Basically to make sure we're not throwing it overboard. Uh, but basically all those those sort of so we get twenty percent coverage pre catch shares. And then after catch your program, we were doing 100%. So everything was being counted. Um, and we realized that you know, we don't need to have all that. We could do, we, we have 20% of statistically by, you know, good number to have. And so we just, uh, that's why we're trying to work on electronic monitoring to get those costs down. It's $525 a day to have an observer on board a boat. And that starts at midnight. So guys don't want to go fishing until, until midnight. And, they want, and so, uh, because if you go fishing at six o'clock, you just blew, you know, for six hours of the coverage, you blew up five hundred twenty-five dollars, and plus you got to get an observer. And some of these ports, you know, Newport's a big port, a lot of a lot of boats, a lot of stuff happened. Harder to get an observer in Fort Bragg, right? They have to wait a day sometimes to get an observer. Um, so we're trying to look at ways to keep accountability and get those costs down. Uh, but for right now, um, so so when we go electronic monitoring on a vessel, we do have an observer on the boat for twenty percent of the time, like we used to. So that number is still intact as far as the uh, as far as the um, uh, biological information. Yeah, sorry, Claire. Um, you mentioned the strong year class after Ninety-nine. Yeah. And um, is there a consensus on what sort of changes? That you know, all I know from being on the, my presentations when I'm in the council is there's the uh, there's the hamburger and celery as far as the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as far as the uh, um, as far as what warm water and cold water bring, so uh, all I know is that cold water seems to be very uh, be very productive, and uh, and actually we've had cold water events before, but didn't have what happened in '99. Because really, to me, it's like what happens. I've never seen an assessment that ever said that it predicted a year class, a big year class. Um, so we really don't know what makes all those stars line up to get those tremendous year classes because they don't happen very often. But when they do, they just re-energize the entire uh, North, the California current. Um, you know, I, I, obviously the food web is way better shape, but there's other things going on there too. And I'm not sure it's, you know, so much information, we get so much more information we used to. 
you get this um, this cable uh, the um, yeah right and so they're taking information out of the water column you know nine times a day the entire water column um, at some point in time we're gonna put that all together and we're gonna really understand what makes this thing work and that's gonna be very, that's exciting really I mean that uh, to get that uh, because if we can do that that's gonna take us into the I mean we can really um, maybe not for ground fish as much because it's so long lived get up, up into uh, uh, up into uh, maturity to harvest but a lot of them a lot of species are fairly short-lived and we could uh, would benefit us greatly. So that's one of the efforts back in D.C., by the way, is to get funding for the Newport line. It's where you were heading with your question. So fatty, <laughs> cocoa, fatty cocoa pods, right? Yeah, yeah. Hamburgers. Fatty Hamburgers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Maybe I should be more clear about that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Brad, I just want to say thank, thank you to you and the scientists, the agencies, the way you gotten the political machinery aligned. I think you guys have done a great, great job. And it's really neat to have you representing that industry here. Oh, thank we you. appreciate thank you. it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's great to be here. It really is. Yeah. So, nothing else? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's about that. uh, so anyway, another nice. round of applause. Oh, thank you. <laughs>